Good. So uh, I'll start discussing. So the enteral nutrition, obviously, we will be focusing on the NICU, not uh, on the term babies at home. So, uh, quick overview of fluid requirements in babies, which is going to be the basis for how we decide the feeds and what to feed and so on. And then a rational approach to managing feeds and residuals in the small babies. So we will have some time for discussion at the end as well, hopefully. So uh, why do we need fluids and why do we need nourishment and nutrition? So obviously we have uh, our body's metabolism and homeostasis. There's a certain amount of fluid balance that you need to maintain the excretory function and the hemodynamic balance. Like if you're uh, having less fluids, you'll uh, get dehydrated and hemodynamically you'll be compromised. And we also need a certain amount of fluids to serve as a vehicle in newborns, especially we give feeds as liquid and that is a vehicle to bring you the nutrition. And uh, the adequate intake of calories, protein, all these are important to maintain the body balance and to prevent catabolism. In terms of a sick newborn, preventing catabolism becomes a very important factor. Even one or two days without adequate protein intake will start um, eating into your uh, body resources. And once the catabolic process starts, it becomes a negative. A baby who is poorly nourished is at a uh, higher risk of infections. They also have uh, less ability to heal and repair their body as well. So uh, we will come to that when we discuss when to start uh, feeding nutrition and TPN. So what options do we have? So first of all, we have to decide whether a baby is suitable to feed orally and uh, whether we need IV fluids or TPN if the baby is unwell. So when we come to feeding the baby, obviously the first choice is going to be breastfeeding and nothing will be better than the breast milk. Even for the premature baby, that's going to be uh, the golden uh, nectar for the baby to help recover and so on. So where possible, it should be exclusive breastfeeding. Even if you're not able to breastfeed directly, you will be using express milk. Uh, donor milk is available in more and more places. Uh, recently, Dr. Kanya posted in the PGA group that we have a donor bank working well. I saw other units in Bangalore have started, and I'm not sure if you have it in Gujarat in the medical college setup, but we will discuss that in the end as well. So donor milk becomes a very valuable resource in the tiny babies, and formula milk becomes the last option. And uh, as far as possible, try to get as much of breast milk into the picture, even if you need to use some formula. In terms of IV fluid, we usually use uh, different combinations of dextrose, usually 10%. Uh, is a starting point unless it's an extreme premature baby with hyperglycemia and the electrolytes will be added accordingly so usually it's sodium potassium and calcium that we need or you may use a combination like isolate when it comes to the maintenance fluid uh, in the extreme premature babies or in the babies below uh, very low birth weight babies even total parental nutrition becomes important because as we discussed about catabolism if the baby is not getting milk they need to get total parental nutrition because you need the protein, you need the lipids. Uh, there is a discussion on whether protein alone can be given to these babies. The answer is going to be no, because if you give protein alone, it will be used as uh, you are using dextrose for calorie needs. It will not be serving the purpose of body repair or enzyme regeneration and so on, which is the main function of the protein, the growth and so on. So you need the lipids as a calorie source in order to preserve the protein for the function they are actually meant to be. Giving the protein alone is like giving a little more concentration of dextrose, that's all. So how do we decide which type of fluid to give? So we have babies over 32 weeks gestation and no clinical concerns, obviously. Even in the developed world, we consider full feeds in these babies. Uh, of course, they may not be able to suck their feed immediately if uh, they're immature. We need the suck solo coordination, which starts around this stage. Uh, there is another dis difference in approach in uh, developed and developing countries. In India, for example, you start skin-to-skin -skin care, kangaroo mother care. The mother is very involved in the care straight away. And so even by 32, 33 weeks, most of you are going for palada feeds and discharging these babies by 1.5, 1.6 kilos. Well, here we keep them till 35 weeks. We have uh, regulations from the Department of Health, uh, and these are medical legal issues. So we don't discharge them before 35 weeks and 1.8 kilos. And of course, we have time in that sense. We don't rush to progress to suck feeds. And uh, palada feeds is an option, but parents may choose either bottle feeding or palada when the breastfeeding is being established. So that's going to be a difference in Indian setup. We avoid the bottle as best as we can. So you give palada or breastfeed so that uh, when the baby goes home, they can breastfeed directly. 
it's important to give adequate volume of feeds from the day one because the hypoglycemia is a risk. So if you're not giving IV fluid, you still need to give a good volume of uh, milk like 60 or 80 ml per kilo because if you give less, they may become hypoglycemic. You still need to monitor the glucose and give the correction as needed. Uh, it's very important to focus right from the antenatal period on breastfeeding. We don't expect prematurity. So unless you have multiple pregnancy or other concerns, you may not know that a particular baby is going to deliver premature. So even though antenatal expressing is becoming a concept uh, in, uh, in front of diabetic mothers, for example, where we know that there is a risk of hypoglycemia postnatally or in multiple pregnancies, other pregnancies, they start expressing one day after birth. And we know that lactogenesis has two or three days to set in. And even if the mother has milk on day one, they may not meet the full needs like 60 to 80 ml per kilo. So that becomes a stage where you consider donor milk if possible, or you may need premature formula for that time when we are waiting for the mother's milk. So we have to encourage that with skin-to-skin -skin care, early feeding, expression within the first hour of birth. So many studies have shown that initiating the breast milk expression early on helps with uh, getting the milk output early. And uh, obviously, if you have a donor milk bank and uh, milk sharing, I mean, pooling of milk within the unit in an informal way is not advisable because we don't know the medical legal implications if there is any viral infection coming from that. And you obviously need to screen for HIV, hepatitis B and everything from the donor. So some mothers come with a question of my sister giving the milk and so on. So you can consider that, but uh, it has to be with consent and explaining all the factors and consider the blood test for the one who is going to share as well. So this is a very interesting study by Dr. Sushma and uh, team. Uh, obviously, uh, they selected babies uh, about 28 weeks who were stable. So they did not take babies on respiratory support uh, or uh, any other uh, uh, sickness. So these are relatively stable babies. A majority of them, the mean age was 31 weeks and the mean weight was 1.3 kilos. So obviously, the smaller the baby, even though they included 28 weeks and above, not many 28 weeks would fulfill the criteria of not needing respiratory support. So typically you would have this approach as 30 weeks and above. And there was a survey by Engelberg and uh, Imbleton in UK. They also said that above 30 weeks, if the baby is hemodynamically stable, more colleagues are uh, comfortable starting full feeds from day one. And uh, obviously if you have uh, express milk in that amount, it's much better, but EBM or donor milk is better. And early exposure to formula, has to be weighed with a pinch of salt. You might have seen uh, the news from US that uh, uh, Meet Johnson was sued because the premature baby developed NEC and apparently they didn't have the information in the leaflet about the risk of NEC. So they were uh, going to be uh, sued for $16 million uh, and their judgment was in the favor of the parents. So when it comes to these situations, I know it's multifactorial. I made a recent video on that as well. So it's not easy to segmentalize when we come to uh, express milk or donor milk versus uh, formula. The breast milk based milk product supplements that we have are very expensive and not readily available. Donor milk is also, even if you have a donor milk bank, if you're a big unit, you may conserve it for the babies at highest risk of NEC, which is the extreme low birth weight or extreme premature baby. So you may not still have the donor milk for a 1.2 kilo or 1.5 kilo baby unless it's really a big donor bag. So you still have to conserve because it's a valuable resource. And so EBM uh, at the word go is becoming the key. And if you don't have enough EBM, what do you do? It will be the first thing as well. So the purpose of feeding is to meet the requirements in terms of calories, proteins, and uh, other supplements. So the fluid requirement is uh, in a premature baby, 135 to 200. I don't usually go to 200. We stop with 160 to 180 maximum. And in term babies, it's a similar volume. Energy requirements for a premature baby is higher, 110 to 135 calories. And uh, for term infants, 90 to 120, this is per kilo. And protein, 4 to 4.5 for the extreme premature baby. For more than one kilo baby, 3.5 to 4. And the term baby, 1.5 to 2.5. And these are the supplements which we will discuss. If you're adding the human milk fortifier, most of these are covered in that you may give additional vitamin D and you may add, give additional iron. But if you're not having fortifier, you will need to add calcium phosphorus as well. Uh, and some of these babies may need sodium supplementation because of late onset hyponatremia. So we have a stable admission in the NICU. It's not really a premature baby, but it's a term baby who has come in for TTN or some other problem. But baby can be fed 
by tube feeds while uh, baby is there. So do we start with the uh, donor milk or formula in these babies while we are waiting for breast milk or do we give IV fluids? So obviously parental involvement is important in these cases and you would need to go with their opinion as well. So both breast milk, donor milk and infant formula contain the nutrients needed for the growth and repair. So uh, even a short period on just dextrose can lead to catabolism and it might set the baby back in the growth process. Uh, feeding keeps the baby more comfortable as well. So we assume that if the baby is kept on dextrose, uh, they will cope, but there may be unrecognized effects of the lack of uh, adequate nutrients in the early stages, which is critical for programming. Uh, you wouldn't go for TPN in the routine cases like what I described because it has its risks, it's expensive, it can be injurious to the liver and so on. You need a central access in most of the situations. Peripheral TPN has a high risk of extravasation injury. And uh, of course, there is a risk of infection. So in stable babies who are bigger, you wouldn't really consider TPN. And uh, any intravenous intervention has a higher risk of infection compared to uh, oral route. Uh, so if you are tube feeding with uh, express milk or donor milk or formula, it's better than starting IV if the baby will tolerate feeds. But if you are using formula, make it clear that it's a medical intervention. Make sure you have the support system in place to encourage the milk output. This is a critical part. The one or two days it takes to get adequate EBM, the mother should be uh, supported very well. The breast pump should be provided after the first day. She can hand express every uh, at every opportunity, two to three hourly on the first day as well. And we should stress the risk of NDC, as I mentioned in the earlier uh, discussion. Always, uh, if you have a consent form, I would suggest that we add this, that premature formula or any formula increases the risk of NDC so we don't end up in a situation like uh, what Mead Johnson faced. So what are the situations we can give IV fluid? So we may have term or near-term babies with respiratory distress, and you feel the baby is not stable enough to start tube feeds. Uh, majority of the babies in non-invasive ventilation are stable enough to start, but if the baby is acutely unwell and you're considering uh, need for surfactant and so on, or you feel baby might need intubation, you can wait a few hours without starting feeds and keep them on just uh, dextrose. A few hours shouldn't harm. And where there is initial need for resuscitation, you're not sure whether the baby will need cooling or something, you can wait till the neurological course and uh, maybe the CFAM study is clear. Uh, babies with risk factors for hypoglycemia where you have a low reading, despite the initial steps, uh, then you would need to consider IV fluid as well. And babies over 33 weeks with symptoms as above or hypoglycemia, but they're expected to tolerate the feed. So you wouldn't consider TPN in these babies. So you would be going for uh, IV fluid, which is uh, dextrose, plain dextrose in the usual cases. And uh, babies below 1,500 gram and usually below 32 weeks would have a central line UVC or uh, pick line from the day one and you would start central TPN. Again, go for full TPN, don't go for partial TPN with just amino acids and dextrose because we discussed that earlier that you need to conserve the calories. The babies below 33 weeks and birth weight less than 1,750 gram with significant symptoms, we expect the baby to take longer to tolerate the feed. So in these situations, you would again uh, start TPN, but it's not essential. You can wait two or three days with dextrose with the trophic feeds and gradual progression. And if baby doesn't tolerate, you may go for TPN as well. So a central line is not necessary in these babies where you think you can go over three, four days to reach full feeds. And babies with NEC or its complications where we need to keep off feeds for a period of time. Uh, there are some term babies, especially related to surgical conditions, gastroschisis, for example, they need a long time to tolerate feeds, malrotation after repair. So these are the situations where you would consider TPN. Uh, obviously, this bigger group of babies, we will be going to the standardized feeding regime as well next. But uh, when a baby comes into the eligibility criteria where you would start full feeds when they are stable, you don't need to go step by step. So if the baby is clinically stable and you have reached, say, 30 or 60 ml, you can go direct to full feeds uh, in a rapid progression. So you don't need to go that 20 or 30 ml per kilo per day. If the baby would otherwise qualify for full feeds from day one. The sicker the baby, the slower you would go, obviously. If the baby was hypotensive, if the baby was ventilated, you can go step by step in those cases. But if baby has just mild distress in the beginning and settles and improves quickly, you can be reaching full feed soon. So how much fluid do we give? On day one, we give on the lower side if there is respiratory distress because there is a risk of syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. And if the baby is having hypoglycemia or borderline sugars, you may go on the higher side and monitor the sodium. 
uh, if the sodium starts dropping, obviously you would need to concentrate the dextrose. So SADS can coexist with hypoglycemia risk, so we have to balance that. In a term baby, we may start with 50 to 60 ml unless there is asphyxia. In a preterm, uh, 32 to 36 weeks, 60 to 80 ml per kilo. And uh, 28 to 32 weeks, 80 to 100 ml per kilo. And babies less than 28 weeks, we can start with 100 ml per kilo. But you would need frequent assessment and increments because there is a risk of hypernatremia. Uh, urine output may drop. Hyperkalemia in these babies is a risk as well. So you need to relax the fluids uh, much more than the other groups. And you need to make frequent adjustments and monitoring in the tiny babies. From day two onwards, usually uh, we increase by 10 to 30 ml per kilo per day. And sometimes you may go in, ten, uh, in 12 hourly steps of 10 ml per kilo if you are not sure whether the baby needs more. So sodium, you are monitoring the weight, you are monitoring. And you may not jump to 30 ml per kilo per day increments. You may increase 10 ml review in the evening with the gas sample for sodium, for example, and then make the adjustment. Uh, the maximum intake usually is 160 ml per kilo per day, except in some babies who need 180. I have hardly ever gone to 200 ml per kilo because the higher fluid you give, there is a higher risk of PDA, BPD, and even reflex risk increases. So we can manage adequate calories with the premature formula or with the EBM with human milk fortifier. So we rarely need to go beyond 160 to 180. And uh, don't forget the important role of temperature regulation, humidity management when it comes to fluid management. Sometimes we don't start humidity in a 32-weeker, but you see the sodium rising to 150. Baby has lost 150 gram in one day. These babies are quickly switch on the humidity, and that allows you the flexibility with the fluid balance you need. Because each baby is different. You have to individualize the care according to what you see. You cannot say every 32-weeker has mature skin and has less insensible loss and they don't need humidity. So you have to, same in a similar fashion, you have to just accommodate it as well. Even in a less premature baby or more premature baby, you may wean the humidity faster as well. So there are uh, some important things to monitor the fluid balance. So we have uh, vital signs, tachycardia, blood pressure uh, may indicate that you need more fluids. Acid-based balance, you look for lactate and uh, acidosis, which are not direct indicators. Obviously, you don't want to reach the stage where you have a hypotension and a high lactate, you want to pick up before that. Capillary filling time, peripheral temperature and perfusion are important. You look at the urine output. Uh, serum electrolytes, we may have hyponatremia or hypernatremia guiding your management as we discussed earlier. We have the blood glucose levels and the daily weight change is important as well. Some extreme premature babies, you have the incubators with inbuilt uh, weighing scales. You may do it twice a day uh, along with the urine output monitoring, sodium balance and so on to uh, check. And the urine output uh, measurement can be using the uh, weighing the nappies in these babies. In a premature baby, usually a 12 hourly output is uh, adequate when the baby is stable. And you could do once daily, once they are stable. And uh, in the extreme premature, six to eight hourly in the first days, and then 12 hourly will be the standard. So when do we introduce feeds and when to progress? So there are multiple studies which have looked at uh, feeding regimens and where a unit follows a standard feeding regimen. It doesn't matter if it's slightly different from other protocols. If everyone in your unit follows the same pattern, there is less risk of NEC and the outcomes, the time to reach full feeds, the time on central line and infection rate, everything is much better in these babies. And very important to encourage express breast milk right from birth. If no express milk, we may wait 24 to 48 hours in the extreme premature babies. The more premature the baby, the higher the risk of NEC and the more you want to avoid exposure to formula. Of course, if you have donor breast milk, you don't need to wait. You can start even in the first 24 hours, the trophic feeds. Uh, if you have just a drops of uh, colostrum, you can use it for oral care. If it's not enough to feed the baby, you can just apply it in the mouth of the baby. If you're not starting TPN, like in a borderline uh, premature baby who is 33 or 34 weeks and is still small, don't delay starting feeds, especially because uh, if the baby is sick, you would only do a phased progress. If the baby is hemodynamically unstable on vasoactive medication, we would stay on trophic feeds during this phase. But uh, trophic feeds can still be given when the baby is on inotropes or has hypotension, unless baby is really unwell with bleeding in the gut and so on. Uh, NEC, of course, you wouldn't feed the babies. Umbilical arterial catheter is not a contraindication to starting or progressing with the feeds, but make sure the line is in the correct position, especially if it is in the uh, 
low position it shouldn't be uh, sitting near the mesenteric arteries you should be sure about that you can use ultrasound guided approach to check the level as well uh, if there is severe growth restriction on antenatal doppler especially if there is reversed or prolonged absent uh, in diastolic flow you have to be cautious but don't be over cautious there is uh, no evidence to show that holding the feeds for a 5 to 7 day period in these babies or keeping them just on trophic feeds is going to be helpful of course you can be more cautious and follow the high risk regime of 15 to 20 ml increment rather than 20 to 30 ml increment even if the gestational age group would warrant a higher rate of increase so at least for the first 2 3 days till the baby tolerates you can go with a slower increment but don't uh, hold on trophic feeds alone just start progressing when the baby is clinically stable trophic feeds are the feeds that are used to prime the gut to support the enteral hormone system and the maturation of the mucosa it also has an impact on the healthy gut flora because uh, the babies are invariably exposed to antibiotics in the early stages and uh, breast milk as well as cesarean uh, i mean the normal delivery improve the gut microbiota in addition uh, early feeding not keeping the baby npo will help you develop the gut microbiota in a healthy way dysbiosis has been shown to have an impact on multiple aspects of a premature baby's outcome especially the gut health and nec but uh, even the neuro development and so on as well so it's very important to focus on gut health from the word go when to start increasing feeds will be a clinical decision based on overall stability and uh, evidence of gut motility like bubble opening in some very premature babies you may give a glycerin suppository or even a rectal wash uh, to stimulate the gut motility and in the extreme premature baby sometimes we give gastrographin uh, to uh, allow the inspissated stool to pass if they are not tolerating the feeds so most units increase 15 to 20 ml per kilo in babies less than 1000 grams uh, which is a high risk group and what i mentioned in the severe iugr babies when you apply the high risk group you follow the same approach even if the baby is little over 1000 gram or uh, even 1500 gram uh, in the bigger babies you would follow 20 to 30 ml per kilo per day once they start progressing from trophic feeds and when we say progressing from trophic feeds we actually start looking at increasing from the day 2 itself you start with trophic feeds on day 1 or 2 and the very next day you can start increasing if they are tolerating so don't have a specific time period unless it's a 22 or 23 weeker in which case you would keep them on trophic feeds for a longer time after the baby start tolerating about 60 ml per kilo and we are opening that bubbles regularly even if it's a 1000 gram baby you could start going up up to 30 ml per kilo but if you choose to go with the 20 ml per kilo rate it's fine as well Uh, but go on the higher side of this range don't stick on uh, 15 or 20 go to 20 or 30 according to what suits human milk fortifier is usually started when the baby is on 80 to 100 ml per kilo per day and usually we start with half strength for a day and then go to full strength i am not exactly sure about the hmf you get in india so we will discuss that in the end we in the tpn off during the period uh, when you are coming to nearly full feeds the total fluid intake we aim is 160 to 180 and when we reach 130 and above we may stop tpn because of the cost and the central line implication and just give clear fluid most of the time we keep the central line till the baby reaches the full volume so we use that to keep the clear fluid and it's an additional day and uh, hopefully you can manage but if there is any issue with the line we remove it and uh, we can accept a lower uh, total fluid intake for a day if the baby will tolerate it so the frequency of feeds during trophic feeds you may give 2 to 4 hourly it's a small volume of feeds so the nursing staff may prefer to give less frequently but once you start progressing we move to 2 hourly and then we maintain 2 hourly till the baby is on full feeds and uh, coping of the non invasive ventilation so the 2 hourly feed stays till the baby's weight is 1.5 kilo or so and the baby is off the respiratory support if you are on non invasive ventilation irrespective of the weight we try to maintain two hourly feeds to reduce the risk of reflux but this practice can vary according to your unit and uh, those who use three hourly feeds they say it works but uh, I, my preference is to keep two hourly feeds uh, reason is if you give two hourly you are giving one third less volume in the stomach at any period so there is a possible reduction in the respiratory concerns like intermittent hypoxemic episodes from reflux so uh you don't really gain much apart from the nursing workload when you go from 2 to 3 hourly but you could gain by reducing these concerns from reflux and over treating the baby from these episodes would reduce so when the baby is stable we go to 3 hourly and then suck feeding around the same time 
Human milk fortifier is obviously a product that is added to uh, breast milk, express breast milk, after the baby reaches 80 ml per kilo. It increases the calorie content and the protein content from the express breast milk. It matches that we get from premature formula. It also adds sodium, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. Some of the fortifiers have iron, but it depends on what you are using. If you are not adding the fortifier uh, due to availability or cost issues, you need to add additional calcium and phosphorus and WHO has recommendations for adding these for the premature babies as well. So if you're adding HMF or the babies on preterm or supplemented formula, you don't need separate calcium phosphorus. The human milk-based HMF has come up in the recent years. Obviously, there is a lot of market push for it, but it is very expensive and there is no clear evidence to show that it really makes a difference. So you have to judge according to your local situation. Maybe if a parent can afford and you have it available, you can use it. But uh, as a gen general routine, it's going to be difficult. Uh, the, all the premature babies would need vitamin D and we usually give a higher dose. So the fortifier might give you like 300 uh, units and we may add another 400 or 600 units. Some premature babies were extreme preterm, we give 1000 or even more when they are at highest risk of osteopenia. And osteopenia of prematurity is not a big issue after we have the recent TPN changes as well and we start fortifying the human milk and we don't see much of our osteopenia of prematurity. And of course, the premature baby needs iron supplement after two to three weeks of age. Whether you start at two or three weeks can be a unit policy, but you can say you will start iron once you're on full feeds and tolerate it well. Uh, just a quick example of how you would approach. Uh, we have a 29 weeker, slightly growth restricted at 1.2 kilos. Baby has RDS and is on NAPPV. On day one, the UVC was inserted and starter TPN with lipids was started. Uh, you can start dextrose till the TPN comes if you are getting the TPN from another center or you don't have a ready-made uh, standard bag. You can also start oral colostrum care as soon as the milk is available. If the mother starts expressing within the first hour, obviously the output is going to be better. On day two, you would go to 100 ml per kilo, start trophic feeds at 10 to 20 ml per kilo. And uh, on day three, increase 20 ml per kilo. And if feed is tolerated, you move to 20 ml per kilo, two hourly feeds plus TPN, and uh, day four will be 40 ml feeds and uh, remaining as TPN, the TFI has gone to 140. On day five, to TFI 160, total fluid intake, feed 60, and the rest TPN, and day six will be 90 ml per kilo feeds. Day seven will be 120 feeds and so on. So once the baby starts tolerating 60 ml per kilo, as I indicated, we started going up on the higher level of the range, which is 30 ml increment. And by day eight, the baby's off the TPN, and by day nine, you can remove the central line or even day eight if you want. So if you're comfortable, baby is tolerating. So this is a kind of step-by-step -step approach. And that is the reason you don't want a significant lag in the beginning because you would not break protocols. You may not uh, increase faster just because you didn't get milk for the first two, three days. You still go step-by-step. -step. So every day you delay is uh, going to be a problem. The important question of uh, residuals comes up when you're feeding the premature baby. So it's very controversial. It's not important whether we check for residuals or not. Most of the time, the nurses uh, check the aspirate, but the importance of residual is you're emptying the stomach fully. So when you suck out more, there is a risk of gastric uh, mucosal irritation. Use the syringe with the lower suction possible and uh, don't uh, do the full residual check unnecessarily. If there is a concern, you can do that along with abdominal girth. But checking the tube position just needs to withdraw 0.5 ml or so while to check residuals, you're actually emptying the stomach. So avoid checking the residuals if the baby is stable. And uh, more important question is how we respond to residuals if you have. We shouldn't hold the feeds as we discussed in the earlier slide. You don't want to delay the progress, so you wouldn't hold the feeds unless there's a clear reason. And uh, many of the units, unfortunately, the night shift, you're worried about what the consultant would say the next day. So you decide to hold feeds as a safer option. You can hold for one feed or two, but don't hold for a full shift because eight to 12 hours is a very long time when it comes to cumulative line hours or days. And the team should be empowered to make decisions, give them a guideline. That's why the standardized guideline is important, how to handle residuals. And so you would use the smallest volume syringe for checking the residuals to avoid the excessive suction. Never use the suction catheter to empty the stomach. This should be drilled in right from the labor room period. If the gastric residual is less than 30% of the cumulative feed volume, you would assess the baby and replace the aspirate, you may hold that feed and uh, or give the rest of the feed volume as fresh milk. 
we avoid discarding the residual volume because the gastric secretions the stomach enzymes everything is mixed with it and it is rich in electrolytes so don't discard it just replace it and if you have a little more volume you give the milk instead of that uh, the residual volume is a cumulative feed volume if you are checking every 2 hour feeds and you are checking the residual over 6 hours it's a 3 uh, feeds of 2 hourly volume if you are on 2 ml or 3 ml 2 hourly it's uh, 2 times 3 that is 6 ml is a total feed and 2 ml will be 30 percent so that's how you calculate the cumulative residual if the residual is more than 30 percent but less than 50 percent since the last aspirate replace the aspirate but reduce the feed volume by 20 percent and continue to monitor by monitoring we mean uh, feeling the abdomen listening to the bubble sounds the clinical stability of the baby and the vital signs uh, if the residual is more than 50 percent or if the baby is vomiting or shows other signs of clinical instability, we consider holding the feeds for two feeds and restart with uh, 20 to 30 percent less. But if concerns persist, obviously you don't want to miss NEC. So you would uh, screen the baby for sepsis and do an abdominal x ray. And uh, if you are on non invasive ventilation, consider reducing the support if the baby will tolerate because sometimes when the baby is on NAPPV, they get a high gas flow and that may affect their feed tolerance. So if you are on high flow or CPAP, it becomes a routine to leave the feeding tube open 15 minutes or so after the feed, and you can leave it uh, suspended a bit high so the milk doesn't flow back. Uh, we discussed earlier about use of glycerin suppository if the baby isn't passing stool spontaneously. So we may have a PR in order of once in 48 hours if the baby doesn't pass stools. Uh, more rapid evacuation of meconium in the first week may improve feed tolerance in extremely low birth weight, though there are some studies, there's no clear-cut evidence, but you may use it if the baby doesn't open regularly. So prophylactically, no, but if baby has reduced emptying, you can. There is no role for uh, PPI or ranitidine, in, and ranitidine, of course, isn't available in most of the countries, and omeprazole should never be used to treat feed intolerance because you need the gastric acidity to protect these babies against the risk of NEC. Erythromycin use has enough insufficient evidence, but if you're considering urea plasma infection and you want to give a course, you can do it uh, to meet both purposes. Uh, most units nowadays use probiotics, but you should be sure about which product you are using. The quality control of these is important as well. And it's uh, important, and we do use probiotics in babies under 28 weeks after they reach 50 ml per kilo of feeds. So uh, this is a summary of uh, the feeding of uh, premature babies. I have not discussed term babies, but uh, there are many videos on my channel about breastfeeding and supporting breastfeeding. Uh, I hope this is useful. We can have some questions if any of you have questions.